मिट्टी में बो अपने सपने और सीज प्यार से extremely privileged to have Mr. Nafteej Sarna today. Nafteej ji, uh, is, for me it is uh, an honor to have him come and stay at the hotel as the general manager. <coughs> I know sir for a long time and being the point of contact for Ministry of External Affairs while I was uh, in Delhi for a long period of time. I used to see him walk down the aisle of uh, Ministry of External Affairs and we used to all move ahead <laughs> and Sir has uh, been the ambassador to United States of America, UK, Israel, all the important countries we name it and Sir has done it. Thank you for honoring us today and with him today we have uh, Ms. Isha Datta. She's the honorary convener for Northeast uh, Affairs and as of the SAS Women of Calcutta. And uh, so we are honored and the, and the audience today uh, being part of uh, Prabha Ketan Foundation and their initiative. We, we have this uh, all this afternoon that we were going to be extremely honored. So we are here all years. Over to you, Ash. Thank you. Uh, a good afternoon to our audience today. Yet another session of an author's afternoon. And uh, like with the introduction, it is equally an honor and a privilege for me to be seated here with um, someone who earlier in the afternoon, Anindita was saying, you know, you should uh, speak to Mr. Sarna and, you know, just give him the flow of questions. I said, if there's anyone who needs preparation this afternoon, it's me. He's already very, very accomplished in this field of answering questions and facing probably the toughest ones. So, um, welcome to an author's afternoon, Mr. Sarna, and welcome to Kolkata. And with your widely travelled career, I'm sure Kolkata is not a first time for you. Well, thank you very much, Isha, and thank you, Arnav, for those kind words. Pleasure always to be back at the Taj. Uh, Kolkata is is not first time, certainly, but uh, not too many times. Okay. Uh, um, and. Uh, the best time that I spent here was a very long time ago, it was in, uh, in 1981. Uh, we were on our Bharat show. And we, uh, we came here and stayed uh, at the Great Eastern Hotel, which was the grand old lady of uh, Calcutta at one time. And I remember just going from place to place. I mean, it had a great billiards room, so most of my Bharat was spent playing billiards. <laughs> uh, so that's been a long time back and there have been a couple of other visits, but, but it's not really been on, on the beat, so to speak. But uh, nice to meet you. Uh, welcome to our city. Okay, so you've been a uh, columnist, an essayist, of course a diplomat, a very uh, distinguished diplomat and of course an author. So what I wanted to ask you is, uh, was joining the Foreign Service a conscious career choice or would you have just been a writer right from the start? Well, may I just make one request? If we can just do the pictures from the side, I think we've got enough pictures because then I can't see the, uh, the audience. The Foreign Service, you know, in, in our times when we were began, it, it was one of those things that it was a great career and it was seen to be a great career. So uh, most of uh, people chose a career and uh, 
the Foreign Service was one of those dream uh, aspirations that one had uh, as a youngster. Uh, to be honest, my, my mother introduced me to it and said, no, no, I think you should go to the Foreign Service. A fact that she has never stopped regretting since because I spent so many years away from her. Uh, but being a writer uh, was, was not even a choice. Uh, you know, I, 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 ever since I started to uh, consciously think back, um, and, and I would say in college days, I mean, it was, it was a great uh, desire that, you know, and I never saw it as a career. Uh, but the career was different and writing was something that you had to do. You had to find your, your way of uh, uh, going about writing. And, and, you know, I was not one of those guys who, who knew how to just write a book, you know. There are people who were 21 suddenly produce this book and life is never the same again. Uh, I wasn't one of those. So I, I wanted to find little ways of how to write and how to, uh, you know, how to get something published, etc. So uh, I started writing with uh, uh, what was called the evening news in Delhi. It used to be an institution for those who may be able to think like long back. It was, it was 10 pesa. And everybody who went to Connaught Place in the evening bought an evening news. It was sold at uh, traffic lights, it was sold everywhere. And you, that's you, the news you got because there was no television worth the name. Uh, and so the, I started writing for the evening news and uh, there was a university column they gave me. So I used to write a university column twice a week. Uh, and that's where, you know, I, I sort of began to get my uh, sort of uh, uh, play, you know, in that sense. And then I moved on from there to newspaper features, book reviews, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. But to come back to your question, it was not, uh, it, it was never seen as a career because honestly, I mean, journalists in those days were, you know, you either had tea or you had the biscuit, you know, you could have both. So then, uh, so there was no question of ever going to my father to say that I want to become a journalist. Uh, and uh, I was on the, on the strength of those columns, I was one day called to the chief editor of Hindustan Times office, Mr. Hiran Mai Karlikar. And uh, he said, you want a job? And I hadn't even uh, finished my graduation. So he said, you want a job? Oh no, I just finished my graduation, but not my postcard. So I said, I thought about it for a day and went back politely and said, no, I think I need to study. So that's, that's all it meant. So uh, in your career as a diplomat, you've served in countries as diverse as the USA, Soviet, Moscow, that's the USSR, communist Poland, Israel. So each country must have brought up its, with it its own set of difficulties, challenges, the highs and lows. So, take us through some of your uh, journey through this. What were what was something memorable which you remember from those times? Oh, what was not memorable? Okay. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, just, uh, I think it's been a it's been a joyride of great proportions. But the the important thing for that has been, and uh, uh, I think that's an essential for any job, but particularly a diplomat's job is that you have to go in with a very open mind and you have to go in with uh, uh, the idea that look, no matter what, I'm going to, you know, make the most of it. And because things don't sort of go like this, they always go like this. And, uh, you know, in, as in any profession, there are some people who start with great breaks and some people who to crawl, crawl up the ladder. I was one of the latter. I mean, but I had very exciting postings right from day one. Very difficult. I mean, Soviet Russia was really difficult. And that was my first post. It was, you know, uh, uh, very difficult conditions. We were not paid anywhere like diplomats. Our, dipl our diplomats are paid today. Uh, you know, you uh, uh, there was no availability of things. Uh, it was a different world, which most of you would, cannot even imagine. The, the, the East Europe and the Soviet Union of the communist days 
it was a different world, different world politically, different world in terms of availability, how you went about things, and extreme weather conditions. Uh, and But, I mean, I wouldn't change a day of it. And then we did four years in communist Poland, but it's so exciting, very difficult, because they didn't even have the money that the Soviet Union had. But they had the same problem. So, for instance, in Moscow, every night, the main avenues were used to be cleaned by machines of the snow. So, you'd get these huge machines would come out at night and push the snow, push the snow onto the pavements. In Poland, they didn't have money for doing that sort of a thing. So, all they could do at best is throw salt on the snow. So, then you were driving, you were skiing and driving at the same time, you know, it was sort of skidding around, around the roads. Uh, extreme weather conditions, old uh, heating pipes. I remember when uh, at one time the temperature was something like minus 30 and everything broke. Uh, the electricity, the heating, uh, everything sort of collapsed. The only thing that was working, I think, was possibly the telephone. And uh, the house was ice cold. And we, you know, we, we didn't, uh, so uh, my son was, I think, about less than a year old. So, all we had to do was put on all the gas burners and sleep as close to the kitchen as you safely could. So, you know, it was not all glamour. Yeah, it uh, but it was so exciting because, you know, you had great access as a diplomat. Even in the, uh, India had a great relationship. So, in this communist, you know, I could get as a very junior officer, I could get a, uh, a minister to my house, you know. So, things like that were really exciting. So each posting had its uh, romance, it had its adventure, it had its difficulties. We were the closest Indian mission to Chernobyl when the accident took place. So we actually were out in the park because it was a sunny day, 29th of April, I think, summer, early summer, and the cloud was actually going over Warsaw. And nobody knew because news was blacked out. So nobody knew anything had happened. And this, so it went there, it got picked up in Sweden, and then it floated back. And all the time we had been out, and there was a huge panic on Warsaw, and people didn't know what to do when the news actually came out through Sweden. And, uh, and then there was a rush for liquid iodine. So, uh, you know, and it, these were not uh, any way developed in any sense. You can't even imagine those things today. We actually managed to get through a friend liquid iodine in a test tube. And uh, we gave it to my son because he was the youngest and that, you know, we thought better protect him first because liquid iodine uh, saturates your thyroid. So you don't take in the radioactive iodine. So, you know, that's all, so all sorts of things happened, you know, uh, 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 I was in Bhutan and in Bhutan there was an outbreak of rabies in Thimphu and uh, nobody can kill the dogs there because the old queen mother, I mean not the present four queen mothers but the uh, K4's mother had prohibited the killing of dogs. So there were wild dogs and then the pigs got raped. And there were wild pigs, and then the cows got raped. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, so. These are things which if you know you can't make them up. So and so on and so forth. When but in retrospect, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you yeah, when you leave it, you'll say, why? <laughs> what did I choose this for? You know. But uh, you know, my first job I was with the Tatras. I could have been like hung up in this five-star comfort for all my life. But, uh, you know, we had fun and there were other, I mean, all my How courses. was Israel? Oh, Israel was really the most exciting course. Mm -hmm. you know, I spent four years, A, it was my first ambassadorship and which is always something special uh, because the first time you have a mission of your own, you can give it a direction, you, you learn how to handle a lot of people you, and there's a constant sense of responsibility as well as privilege. Uh, so I did four years there and Israel was very exciting because it's a very complex country. It's hugely complex in terms of not just the politics which everybody reads about, but religion, language. Uh, it's, it's actually 
the crossroads of Christianity, Islam, Judaism. And the holiest places of all these three religions are in one square mile uh, of, of all Jerusalem. Uh, so, you know, and even in the in Judaism, in the Jewish society, there are so many, um, there's, there's so much stratification, there is so much uh, complexity. So again, I just threw myself headlong into them. I went to, you know, dozens of Shabbat dinners. I attended prayers. I walked every court, every inch of the old city. Uh, and, you know, the fortunate thing is of being an Indian, uh, and I hope it stays that way, you know, as you went to the Arab quarter, people sang Indian songs. You went to the Jewish quarter, people loved you. The Armenians loved you, the Christians loved you. And, you know, huge amount of attraction uh, for that. And I actually managed to produce a book out of Israel. I was just going to come to that. Israel. You have written a book on Jerusalem, yes. Yeah. Um, you were also the voice and the spokesperson for the Ministry of External mm. Affairs. And uh, that must have come with another different set of challenges. Mm. So was there any preparation, any briefing that uh, you had to go through to face the press, the media? Yeah, I was fortunate that I had uh, grown up in in the foreign service with a certain uh, uh, you know a few occasions in which I was uh, yes, working yes. with the press, and I think a lot of this also happened because I had been a kind of a part-time journalist before becoming a diplomat, so I had a natural affinity towards journalism. So I wasn't, you know, there are various kinds of diplomats. There are some diplomats who see a journalist and, you know, say, keep him out, shut him out, he'll bite me, you know, mm -hmm. some things like that. There are some, some diplomats who sort of see a journalist and want him go and want him to come and talk to you, want to take him out for dinner, whatever. So, they, you know, it's a, it's a different mindset. So I, I was quite open to journalists. I had worked as the spokesman's right-hand man in the mid-80s, in 84, and I had handled the press. I mean, I was in Washington in my earlier uh, posting there as the minister counselor for press and information. So I had, a, I had that, and then I was pitchforked into this job of being the spokesman, and I st stayed home for six years. I mean, it requires uh, both are very thick skin and, <laughs> and skin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it was it, it was a great job. It was an absolutely great job because we, uh, you know, we built we built up a tremendous institutional system for the MEA to engage the press. Uh, and and those days, for instance, a lot of press used to travel with the prime ministers. Yeah and the foreign minister, you know, we used to take 34 senior editors in the aircraft uh, with us. And so, you know, all the logistical arrangements, all the briefings, because a lot of what happens in diplomacy uh, needs to be protected properly. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, sometimes we realize that, sometimes we don't realize that. And then, so, so you know, to inculcate that thing, uh, so that, that was, you know, Reward, rewarding, very rewarding. So from a diplomat to an author now, so what was the impulse to write? I know you come from a family of writers, very highly acclaimed writers. Both your parents are very highly accomplished writers, Sahitya Academy Award winners. And so the atmosphere at home must have always been conducive to writing. Mm. But this is something you have said before that is something, it is like almost like your passion. You enjoy writing so much. Yeah, I can't, I really can't imagine what I would have done if I hadn't been writing. So, you know, because uh, your career is one thing, but I always, I always have felt that a career is not enough. You can't define yourself by your job because jobs end, jobs change, yeah. uh, jobs get devalued. Uh, and then what do you do? You know, uh, people retire from a job. So, so I, I, I think it's important to sort of uh, give yourself something else. In other. And for me, you're right. I mean, it, our home was all about writing and reading. Uh, there were only books at home, nothing much more. Uh, my parents, my father also was in government, but he, he was a, essentially a writer. Uh, 
my mother did a fair amount of writing and a large amount of translation. So it was always, I mean, if people sat around in the evenings over tea, it was all about books and writers and uh, English writers and Punjabi writers and, you know, uh, comparisons and, and in those sort of, so that was there from childhood. And then my own interest, in, I was a voracious reader as a child. So I, you know, all the reading, uh, you know, gave a curiosity of its own as to the art, as to the craft. Uh, as to how do people do this? Uh, and, and that's, you know, that, so, at, uh, I mean, we, of course, all of us write poetry in school. But, uh, you know, beyond that, to sort of carry on, uh, was again uh, something which I never ever thought should I be doing this. I said no, I, I had to do it. So yeah, it, it was it was more or less automatic. So writing is like essentially an act of uh, like telling a story, communicating an incident or uh, incidents. So you have written over a diverse range of subjects that I have to say. You have a book on Guru Nanak, you have uh, novels, your first novel, We Want Lovers Like That. You have, of course, your folk tales on Poland, mm. in, in Poland. Then you have a collection of sto short stories and, of course, your historical novels, one which we will be discussing in a little detail a little later and your first, the earlier one. Mm. So would you like to tell us something about your books, maybe your... Uh, the short stories. How did? They, what about the book on Guru Nanak? I was a bit curious. Are you a very religious person? No, did that uh, come about? no, it's not. Uh, it's not that I'm very religious, but I'm, I'm fairly rooted. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, again, uh, you can call it what that you know. Maybe you have a spiritual bent of mind. You have a certain uh, sense of belonging to a faith, to a community. I have that. Yes. It's not that I. I have a, you know, deeply religious uh, bent of mind, but it's, again, this was, you see, some books you, you wanted to write, some books, uh, and particularly Book of Nanak, I would never have thought that I can, I'm capable of attempting that book, but it was commissioned. Okay. So after my first novel, uh, We Were Lovers Like That, was accepted by Penguin, uh, they wrote to me and said, we are doing a series on Indian saints. We've done a series on Indian gods. Now we're doing a series on Indian saints. It needs to be a small book. It needs to be uh, nicely told. It needs to be for anybody, not just for the initiated or anything like that. So they were bringing out, you know, there was the book of Kali. There was the book of Krishna. There was the book of Muhammad. And they said, will you do this book of Nanak? And I was between jobs. I had come back from Washington in 2002. I was getting the spokesman's job, but they needed me to, you know, vanish for three months because my predecessor had to be appropriately accommodated. Uh, so the foreign secretary told me, look, yeah, you're getting the job for three months. I don't want to see you go and do something. So I vanished. So then at that same time, this commission came. So I sat and I essentially read whatever I could get my whole uh, hands on and then wrote this book in a kind of story manner, in as attractive a manner as I could. And it worked because it's, it's still being bought 20 years later. And uh, it's a simple, straightforward book. So some books just came like that. Some books came, the stories you asked about winter evenings, uh, you know, when I finished started, when I finished my uh, early journalistic writings, and this was again in Poland, uh, I wanted to write a short story because I thought that's the next thing to do. Because you can't think of writing a novel. You don't, you know, so, as I said, I was climbing up. So I wrote a short story uh, and I didn't know where to send it. Again, it was a communist Poland. I mean, there was no English language magazine. There was nobody to send it to. And somewhere, in some library, I saw a snippet saying that the BBC runs a short story broadcast out of BBC Wales on the uh, on the shortwave. In those days, we used to listen to a lot of shortwave. So I, you know, and I had an old second-hand typewriter, and I 
pounded it out four or five times because every time you made a mistake, you had to type the whole wretched thing again. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, and then I put it uh, into envelope and sent it to Wales. And it got accepted and they paid me 32 pounds. Mm -hmm. I still remember, which was a hell of a lot of money those days. <laughs> so, you know, I said, this is a good thing. So I managed to write three or four for them. And then slowly I kept writing stories. There was a magazine called the London Magazine. I don't know if anybody ever heard of it. It, used to be, it was like the poor man's granta. Very classy, very, very um, aesthetically, very developed. Run, it's been an old magazine. It's been there for about 200 years. But various uh, people have taken it and changed it, etc. And there was a man called Alan Ross, who was a very India person. He had been, I think, born in India. And he was, he was actually a poet and the cricket writer for The Observer for more than 20 years. And he was, he published, uh, uh, I think he published uh, Amitav Ghosh. He published, uh, uh, um, uh, our friend, uh, with the, with the Indian August. Uh, uh, Upaman, Upaman, and so he, you know, he was open. So I sent him three stories, and I said, okay, uh, you know, and then he wrote back to me. He used to write on museum postcards, mm -hmm. and suddenly, in sitting in Poland, I get this museum postcard with the scroll saying. Uh, thank you very much. If you have no other plans, can I keep all three? So, <laughs> I said, yeah, I have no other plans really. <laughs> so, please keep all three. <laughs> so, so, that's so, yeah. collection so slowly it got published around and then after, nobody would publish a yeah. short story collection. I sent it to several people. They said, no, no, go and write a novel. So, I started writing my first novel. After the novel was published, then the short story. So that's how the your first novel came about. Yeah, really first novel awesome. actually was very interesting because you know there's always a first novel in your head. Yeah. And uh, I had this idea that I wanted to write something like this. And every time I said, no, no, this is not working. Let me write something else. This thing would come in the way. Yeah. And then I said, okay, now I'm going to get it out of my system. I have to write it. And then I said, I read a number of books that were being written. And I said, this is all trash. So I said, okay, if they can write trash, I can write trash. Mm -hmm. So I actually, in my computer, named the story trash. Oh boy. Yeah. So I, I still have those, you know, those the discs, those oh, five and a half, not five and the three quarter, whatever, the, the small uh, things we used yeah. to put in computers. Floppies. I have trash one, <laughs> I have trash rev two, <laughs> trash rev three, trash final. I've kept it as trash. I was superstitious. I said, people only publish trash. So I'm going to write some trash. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, novel essentially has to stay within you for a period of time, you know. So did at any point of time you have this, even a fleeting moment of doubt that will it get published or was oh, that never a worry? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. You, uh, I mean, this book, this was my 10th book. Oh. But uh, yeah, uh, when I, you know, I took seven, eight, nine years to finally put it out, to send it to Cross. And I, and I kept thinking, does this really work? Yeah. Does this really work, or will it just it just it does it work only in my mind? So while you are fairly certain that you know publishers know you this that, so the earlier battles are won, uh, but still you are again now fighting a, you are competing against yourself because you've done a good book in the past. It's been recognized. It's been well reviewed, and it's very easy to anticipate that they will say. Yeah, but you know, that one was better than... So, you know, you have that all doubt sorts... I think doubt is good. Yeah. Doubt is good. Yeah. I mean... Mm -hmm. uh, Pushes you. Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, you've written two historical novels. Mm -hmm. That's a, It's very interesting genre because uh, there's history and there's the novel. So, there is the blending of true life incidents woven into the narrative are small stories about real life people, ordinary men and women, who may be fictional or not. 
So your earlier one, which I have not read, I've just read Crimson Spring. Tell us something about the earlier one, the exile. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, you know, both of them started with this whole issue of, I need to write about this, but what do I write? Uh, do I write another uh, factual book of non-fiction research book or do I make it into fiction? So the first one was again something I wanted to write for many years. I was fascinated with this character, Maharaja Dalip Singh, uh, who was, for those who don't know, who was the youngest acknowledged son of Ranjit Singh. And he was on the throne when Punjab was annexed in 1849 by Lord De Lousy. and he was the last wearer of the Koinur uh, besides you know being uh, Maharaja of that huge kingdom. Uh, so I wanted to write about him and when I started trying to research what was written I found there was fairly little. There were essentially two books. Uh, there was a book called Queen Victoria's Maharaja by a lady called Sheila Anand and uh, a Britisher, uh, something, I, I may be wrong about the names, it's a very old book, it's somewhere in the 60s. And then there was a book by uh, Christy Campbell called The Maharaja's Box, which is in, written in the 90s. Now, uh, both of them had been, were, not, were, uh, were non-fictional works, but I found that they really hadn't done justice, in my view, to his, to his mind, to his, to his dilemmas. A child of 11, he's uh, separated from his mother, he's uh, taken away, he's, he's uh, subtly converted to Christianity, he is then exiled. And then, you know, uh, at the end of his life, or, you know, the, heir to such a huge kingdom, he's actually selling pheasant eggs from his estate to, uh, you know, take care of his debts and all that sort of things. So I was fascinated that what must he have gone through? Uh, and that I could not find anywhere. So then I said, this has to become a novel in which I can go into his head and, and try to say, talk about his emotional dilemmas, his, the impact on his fractured personality uh, and so I then you know researched him for years it's horrible these historical novels that they kill you with them because I'm you know I, I, there's something in me which doesn't want to make up history and I'm again this is a point I've repeatedly make and I know there are novelists today who are taking historical themes and making it entirely fictional my problem is that I always feel very responsible that if a young kid of class 11 or 12 picks up this book or picks up that book and says this is Sikh history and reads it and forever there may be the only book they will read and I will be responsible for having given them some strange idea. So what I did was I mixed fact and fiction but I did not change any fact. So I added the fiction where there was no fact to it. You know I filled in the gaps. And that's again what what's happened in Crimson Spring. So I did that novel about Maharaj Adalip Singh, again told in his voice, told in different voices at different times, to really flesh him out as, uh, you know, as a person, as a, he was a very, uh, again, a very tragic sort of figure. Yeah. So it was, you know, great and I managed to, again, talking of diplomacy and writing. Because of my job, I managed to visit virtually every place he had lived. You know, I walked the streets of Paris to find out exactly where he died, where he lived. I went to his estate in England. I went to Lahore Fort several times. I could not have gone as an ordinary citizen. So I managed to do all that. So ultimately, that was the mix of fact and fiction that comes through in historical I, I think it's very it's very important to keep that distinction. Yeah, the, the structure of the novel gives you the freedom to kind of Correct. go into the and yet not distort history. Yes, that's yet not distort. So that's something similar which you've done in this book, Crimson Spring. Mm -hmm. You've revisited one of possibly one of the most gruesome or horrific uh, periods in our colonial past in Indian history, the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, 
and uh, in between you have also put in narratives so there are nine protagonists in your book and there are stories of ordinary men and women on how they came out onto the streets and put up a brave fight aside from the heroes of that time Udham Singh and Bhagat Singh so tell us something about the research this must have been again a crazy amount of research this is crazy this. it's absolutely crazy because this started I think in 2012 because I, not that I was doing it all the time, I was still doing yeah, my other yeah, job, you yeah. know, something to owe to the government of India. So I had to go to office. But, <laughs> but anyway, 2012, I started reading about Chandyamada Bhag because, again, you know, there are uh, milestones come up which make you feel like the centenary was coming up. 100 years was coming up, so I said, ah, good idea, let's write about that. So I started reading about it, then again I found that so much has been written about it. Huge books. So much has been written about Dyer. So much has been written about Udham Singh. I had shelf full, shelves full of uh, uh, photocopied books and actual books. And I said, what new can I bring up if I write about Jalewala Bhag? Unless, and I asked around people, what can... What do you think? They said, no, I'll, are you going to find some new material? Do you suddenly find a bunch of letters from somewhere or a, or a lost file and that is really going to make the difference? And I again realized I wasn't going to do that. But then I realized in part of that reading, I realized that there were so many other things happening in the Punjab at that time. And there was, for instance, the Gadar movement. Uh, there was the Singh Sabha movement happening, the kind of revival of uh, Sikh I identity. Uh, there were the other revolutionaries. There was the freedom movement beginning. There was a Khilafat uh, movement which has started. And there was this whole churn of political activity. The f first World War soldiers had just come back. And again, uh, India sent a million and a half soldiers to the First World War. And the chunk of it, the huge chunk of it was from Petra. Now, they were all coming back. So, I said, you know, what we do is, I had again been imagining this as two books. That there is my Punjab book, which has to be done, and my Jalyawala book. And suddenly, one day, I realized, no, it's one book. You know, maybe it's a lazy way out, but... You know, who's going to do this twice? So, let's make it one book. And then I realized that it actually falls into a pattern. So, you see the protagonist in this book, for instance, you will see a soldier who comes back and is caught in the crossfire, in the, not the cross, in the firing at Jadimada Bhav. You will see the revolutionaries. You do see the freedom movement, the Rao attack. So, again, mixing all this. So, it was huge amounts of research. Uh, without, in this case, knowing what, where it's going, you know. While I was making notes and this thing and thinking about it, I had no idea what the final structure is going to be. And uh, so that was the exciting part, you know, the evolution of this into an actual novel, you know. Because ultimately, two years ago, it looked like a series of nine different short stories. But you kind of threaded them all together. All your nine protagonists yeah. have that common uh, thread being the Jalyawala Bhat Massacre. They were connected in some way or the other. That's right. right. That's right. So one of the central uh, protagonists, Udham Singh. So our knowledge of history, unless we go out and read about it, is textbook history. And very little is spoken about our heroes as such. We know data, we have statistics, we have incidents. But we don't know about the individual stories of our heroes, they just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, what about the research which went into Udham Singh? Because as far as I know, there's not much to there's, go by. There's not much. You're absolutely right. Udham Singh is one of the most uh, evasive, uh, elusive uh, characters in history that mm -hmm. I've ever seen, you know. And so, and I've always been fascinated with him. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, yes, we are all fascinated with Bhagat Singh, such a bright mind. You know, to 23, yeah. hang, gets hanged voluntarily, brave. But Udham Singh was, is, is, is shrouded in mystery, yes. you know. And because he was 
A, because he never got that fame. Uh, when he did what he did was shooting of uh, Michael O'Dwyer, uh, he was not uh, he was not praised for it. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi called it an act of insanity. Uh, Nehru criticized, Congress criticized. It took ten years for Jawaharlal Nehru to accept that you know what Udham Singh did needed to be praised. Uh, so. But he did what he did. So again, the research on him was very difficult because there are there are some books on him, but they are of uh, very questionable quality. Uh, they are clearly by people who who have claimed that their father or their grandfather met them, met him, and he did this. So you can't really trust it. Uh, what the solid material that's available is his own letters. His trial transcript, and uh, you know a few other things which have been traced. Now, for instance, Anita Anand did a book on Udham Singh. She and I started working on this subject together, and she raced ahead because she was doing a non-fiction book. So she did a straight Udham Singh book, and in that process, she did research a bit more, which I happily used, and the rest was. Uh, you know, mixing uh, his early days particularly, on which very little is known, I did fictionalize. So the first person account in the last chapter. Yeah, so there that, are parts of it which are fiction. Well, well, a lot of that is actually based on his letters. I see. Okay. So I have converted his letters to his monologues. Oh, a, oh. a lot, you know. And second thing I that came was hugely useful to me was. I actually went to the prison. Really? Uh, it's one of those high security London, London prisons, Pentonville prison, central London. And uh, again, since I was high commissioner, I managed to get permission. But, you know, I said I want to visit. And I actually went and I visited. They took me around the prison inside. And you, you could see that they kind of preserved everything. Nothing. I mean, the prison is a working prison. Okay. So I walked through metal doors and sentries and prisoners banging doors and the whole tamasha and I went to that room where he, they have identified by now that this guy is important for Indians, so so where he was hanged. So there it was working, there are two, three office desks and somebody is having chai and things now. So it's a normal room, but it was a room smaller than this with a you know, a wooden log on which they used to hang people and the trap door would fall open down and there was, so I went down to see where the body fell and that place you can see from where they used to cart away the bodies. Okay, so all that is still there? That is still there physically and then there's a patch of land which is about twice the size of this room where they used to bury, bury them oh, okay. in, in unnamed graves in layers because there's so many and because it was you know again there was the famous Irish revolutionary Roger Casement who was also buried there. Madanlal Dhingra was buried there. He was also hanged there before Udham Singh and Udham Singh was buried there for 1940 to 1974, 34 years. Then I found the file which actually talks of him, his remains being exhumed, brought back to a great celebration in 74, etc. So it was a combination of this plus his letters which and his trial transcript. Because that's hard fact. But you know, by that time I had to give him a voice. I mean, the tricky thing about Kudam Singh was to give that kind of voice which is uh, carefree, courageous, blustering, Everything defiant, <laughs> defiant uh, you know. So to bring in all that with no regret. I mean, that with, needs a different kind of bravado. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, it's, and so he also, you know, some people uh, have said that, oh, you know, your Udham Singh has not been developed enough in the earlier chapters, like the other character. I said. I deliberately did not. He kept it for the last. No, yeah, he comes into his own in the last 
and he's actually just a shadow yeah. in the, even in the book. He's flitting in and out, and that was the way he was. You know, he'd suddenly vanish. He had multiple identities. He had, uh, you know, uh, he, he's supposed to have married several women. He had, you know, he had all sorts of, uh, you know, things, and he was eluding various intelligence services all the time. And he gave them a tough time till the end. He did. I mean, during the trial. He, he yeah. did. He did. Because, you know, he, I mean, he was being forced fed for weeks. Yeah. He so. He used to eat because of his hero, like Bhagat Singh. He was. Yeah. Uh, his, a, his, his hero was Bhagat Singh. I mean, that God. is again a fact, you know, that his hero, he himself says it. That was. So, Udham Singh, um, yeah. So there's Udham Singh and then there is another central character, the only woman character and I cannot end this without touching on her. When you read the book, you all will realize it's probably that chapter is the highest in emotional quotient because there's so much poignancy, so much pathos and she is fleshed out again out of a real character, Maya Dei. So just tell us how that came up. Did you, was the finding about her, I mean... Again, yeah, you know that, home. yeah, that, she, you're right, she's the only woman protagonist mm -hmm. here, but, but she's so central to the book, yeah. uh, that uh, she is actually the true witness to Jagavala <coughs> in, in the book. Uh, I don't want, I mean, people may not have read the book, but uh, the, uh, uh, I don't want to sort of <coughs> talk too much about her, but what I'll say is that, again, you know, the seeds of many of these protagonists were, some were purely fictional, some are absolutely historical, partly fictionalized like Udham Singh, and some are based on seeds of, uh, uh, you know, people somewhere in fact. For she it, was a real person. She was a real person, but there's very little on the person. Okay. There was a woman called Ratan Dei. Okay. Now, Ratan Dei gave testimony to the Gandhi Inquiry Committee on Jalyavadabad, which was a parallel committee set up to the Hunter Committee. Because the Hunter Committee was not interviewing ordinary people. And so Gandhi said, we'll do our own inquiry. So there was one of the few women who gave testimony was this woman called Ratan Dei, who spent a night, that night in Jalyavadabad, besides her husband's body. She went looking, found the body and spent the whole night guarding the body from, because there were dogs and there were vultures and there were all sorts. So he, so the, her testimony is about half a page. So you drew the camera. So I took that uh, testimony and then I have developed my day and she also helped me uh, expand expand the geography of the book to the full Punjab. You know, because she's been given a village across the Jhelum and her life in that village and how they traveled all the way to Amritsar. So it helped me connect the, the home of all these protagonists, which was undivided Punjab. You know, today we don't even know the geography of that Punjab, forget about her history. So I had to connect that entire geography where trains could actually go across the five rivers. Uh, without being stopped, yeah. you know. So, so she actually plays a very vital role because she brings in other things that were happening in Punjab. For instance, through her eyes, I tell you about the plague. Yes. The plague was something which was commonly attacking Punjab. Cholera. Uh, you know, these every year there would be something. So, her life brings in the, a lot of the yes. cultural, social aspects of uh, a lost Punjab, a lost Punjab culture, a lost Punjab geography. Uh, so I think we are almost running out of time, but just to quickly wind up, uh, the massacre, the Jallianwala Bagh incident itself, it was that always the incident you wanted to talk about? Because that in many ways is a turning point in our um, freedom movement. Yeah. Because after that, that served as a provocation to Gandhi, to Rabindranath Tagore, who renounced his knighthood post this incident, it of course there was a lot of uh, reaction from Britons as well in the UK. So was this like a conscious decision you wanted to? Yes, it, that's incident? where it started. That is where that's it where it started, and then it sort of got. We don't have any 
confirmed figure of how many died? No, you don't have a confirmed figure because uh, the figure was debated at that time. But what has been accepted by uh, even the British authorities is a figure of 379. Yeah, which, which doesn't sound very much. Uh, figures given by, you know, there was a sort of NGO of those days called Seva Sabiti, uh, which actually went from house to house immediately in the weeks and months uh, succeeding the massacre to find out. And people were afraid to say. Because they said if we say we were there or uh, somebody from our family was there, we will get reprisal. So, but they came to a figure which was much larger. Uh, even Mahatma Gandhi, I think, put a figure at about 1400 or 1500. Mother Mohan Malbia, who did a lot of this on the ground counting as visits immediately in those months. He also put a figure of, you know, around 1400. So, certainly several hundred, I mean, there are new books. There's a book by Kim Wagner, who's again uh, done some uh, fresh research. But, you know, he says anything like eight to 900 people would have died. It was a very large gathering. It was day. about 25,000 I mean, people. Got that gathering totally captive. I mean, there was no yeah. very little escape route. There was no them. escape route. There were 25,000 people. They were at short range and they, they were relentless firing from 50 guns for about 15 minutes. So, uh, you know, there was no question of it being just 379. So I would have given all these factors. I would say that anything up to a thousand people would have died. Another thousand would have been badly injured if not more. And no, more than a thousand would have been injured because there were piles in, and there was no medical help available. That's curfew. And there was curfew and there was no available. So you see again, you see this Netflix thing on Udham Singh, which shows him single-handedly loading carts and taking them to a hospital. That's not history. It never happened. So if you make a film like that and all of us watch that Netflix film, we, it's going to get into our head that this is what happened. He wasn't even there. He wasn't there. I mean, my book, he's not there. Yeah. Because this has been a huge question mark that was he really there? Yeah. Now, in his trial transcript, he clearly says I was not there. Now, which is something which everybody's missed. But he says I was in East Africa. So in my book, he's in East Africa. He was in deeply impacted, but he was not there. He doesn't need to be there. So if he was, you know, nobody's proved that he was there. But there are indications that he was not there. Uh, finally, something you've been asked many times before, but for the benefit of our new audience here today, we come to the question of uh, reparations and apology. Uh, Is there any apology and apology? Will it ever be enough? Well, you know, this is a now something which we can go on asking for it. I doubt the day will come when uh, the British government actually uses, sorry. I mean, they have said regret. They have said deep regret. I mean, that's as far as the English will go, I think. Uh, you know, and we can say deep regret is not enough. But then if, you know, I, 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 empires don't say so, yeah. you know. And they are, uh, the same thing applies to will they return the Koinur. Uh, well, some things they are beginning to return. But as David Cameron famously said, if we start giving things back, uh, London museums will be empty. You know? so, so, so my feeling is that we can go on making our political points about it without any great expectations. Uh, and I think uh, beyond a point, uh, things move on. Even, even the mood in the United Kingdom is, is not pro-empire. You know, yes. uh, they are chucking out their own statues. Uh, so, I, it's, I think we should continue to make a political point of it because, but I don't think we should really hold our breath. Okay, so finally, any more personal dreams, personal goals now that you want to drive your life towards more writing? Well, yes, uh, since I do fairly little of anything else, uh, <laughs> uh, but yes, if I can, uh, manage to do a couple of more books, uh, it would be nice. 
uh, uh, so far I've only been thinking, I've not really put pen to paper except for articles and essays and, uh, and, and you know, a couple of short stories, uh, but I haven't really summoned up the courage to start another book. We look forward to having you at our next What's This Afternoon <laughs> with your new book. Uh, this <laughs> may be a long way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Swana. This was absolutely delightful. We'll just you. open it out for questions. One thing you would have that cast for. You would have that fascinating cast if I haven't got my facts wrong. Uh, the transition from uh, Obama to Trump. I think you were India's lead uh, diplomat there. Uh, did you sense that change coming in terms of uh, what it meant for India? And uh, do you think there was really a change or uh, old wine in new bottles? Well, uh, I, you're right, I was at the cusp. Uh, but uh, I would be writing another fictional account if I told you that we had an idea of what's coming. <laughs> Nobody had an idea, even Mr. Donald Trump. I was, I reached Washington exactly 48 hours before the election and uh, I was pitchforked there. Nobody knew what's going to happen. Elections were coming, happening on the uh, 8th of November, uh, the, the counting on the, uh, and, and everybody thought honestly that Hillary Clinton would win. And even Hillary Clinton was convinced herself she had her whole uh, future mapped out, who's going to become what, everything down to assistance entry was uh, nominated. And suddenly Trump began to win in the middle of the night and he won. And it was a big shock for the Americans to begin with, forget about us. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, we had to start uh, uh, flapping immediately because uh, you know, Washington is a very set place. The Democrats go out, a certain Repu bunch of Republicans who have meanwhile been cooling their heels in think tanks and universities and all, they move into the offices. And there's a set transition process. Now, he was not the normal Republican. The normal Republicans had rejected him. So he was sitting in his Trump Tower in New York with a bunch of goons, literally, you know, and everything was being run with him and his family. So nobody, and here was, I was at a great advantage, or I was not at a disadvantage, because there are ambassadors in Washington who've been there for 12 years, 14 years, only we send ambassadors for 18 months and two years and things like that. There, Singapore, Kuwait, UAE, they're permanent fixtures. They know everybody in the whole city. So suddenly, they lost their advantage. So we were then, everybody was equal. And we started trying to find new connections, new avenues, new people to get to, into. And the State Department was dysfunctional. Because their protocol didn't know what was happening. Uh, there were no appointments there. They, so we had to, you know, do all sorts of unusual things, including, for instance, in, this Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. There's several evenings I used to go around and hang around the bar having a drink on the off chance that uh, you would meet somebody close to Trump and get an in. You know, it's, it's as vague as that. And it did, it, 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 it worked. Then you went and found who were his uh, uh, friends in the corporate sector. And then you went and met them in New York or, or uh, San Francisco, etc. Then you found a whole, whole new bunch of lobbyists coming into Washington. Because the lobbying is a legitimate exercise in Washington, D.C. Every embassy pays lobbyists to do. Now, our lobbyists had put their hands up. They said, sorry, we can't get you any appointments with these guys. We don't know. So there were new lobbyists who were in towns knocking at your door saying, $50,000, I can get you to meet so-and-so. $200,000 I'll met, get you to meet so and so, so and so, so. So all this nonsense was going on. So, you know, we had to really redo the copy book, but essentially it was that whoever you met, you had to tell them the India US story, the positive India story, etc., and make contacts, etc. So it took a few months uh, until things stabilized. But they did stabilize. We got the Prime Minister there about in six months. 
uh, after Trump came in and it was a very successful uh, visit. And I must say that during the Trump years, I mean, he was unpredictable, he was all that, but for India, uh, I think on trade he was uh, raspy, but on on strategic issues, we got a lot of stuff done, which has now been, you know, moved to another dimension with the recent visit of uh, the Prime Minister uh, on the defense, on the Indo-Pacific, on, on, uh, on military exercises, on uh, trade authorization for dual-use items. Uh, so we, we, did, we did manage. So just, just one follow-up to what you said. You alluded to both lobbyist and think tank, and you dealt with both uh, in your tenure. Uh, there is this general feeling that Pakistan has this far better tape up than we have. Would you would you subscribe to that? Both in think tank uh, infiltration, if I may use the word, or penetration, and uh, the lobbies that they use being far more effective. No, no longer, no longer. Uh, they were at one stage they were considered to be more active in the Congress and they had you know certain uh, friends particularly in the Pentagon uh, on the defense but I think I think we have graduated uh, from that and now I think the dehyphenation is almost complete if not complete that's because of the decimation no I think uh, I think it's the growth of India yeah yeah you said that as a diplomat, you have to uh, protect things very well. So if you were to write a book on your days in Israel as a diplomat, so there must have been things which you would have not rather seen or not heard, would you pen them down? Or if you can share with us some of those incidents. Well, I've, I've actually stayed away from writing about my diplomatic experiences. Uh, it's tempting, but then, uh, you know, it cuts too close to your professional uh, career. And I think, suppose, I don't know how much of it should be written. Some of it should be left unsaid. Uh, so, no, I, I, I don't think I saw things which, uh, uh, which were so bad that I couldn't, can't uh, handle them. Uh, they were difficult, yes. But uh, that's part of it. For instance, when we had the attack uh, on Taj Mumbai, uh, I, had, I was less than a month in Israel. I had nothing with me, even my baggage wasn't there. All I had was my cell phone, my computer and a television in the, working in the house. And uh, I put on the television and I saw the Taj up in uh, flames. And uh, immediately I got a call from the Israeli foreign ministry uh, and uh, they said, we are in the control room and if there's anything you need, please let us know. Oh, fine, that was good and I conveyed it to whatever way I could immediately. And then about half an hour or one hour later, the Habal house, the Jewish uh, place in Mumbai was attacked. And then I again got a call that now we are in this together. So, etc. And then for the next three days, we worked very closely together to get them all the special permission to come, to get their planes in, to get their commandos in, to get their weapons in, uh, and then to get the bodies out uh, without being tampered. You know, the, they, were, they were very orthodox Jews. He was the rabbi and his wife. So, they're, they're very, they send their own people to prepare the body. Even if there's a bomb, they will pick up pieces of the body and put it together, not leave this much behind. Uh, and they don't want it tampered. In. And it's very difficult to handle all this in, in the kind of security situation that Mumbai was under. Uh, but we managed and they got them back. And I actually went to receive those uh, the bodies at midnight and then uh, next day I was at the Chabad village which is the orthodox village which I mean you can't imagine it looks like some strange uh, you know Salvador Dali painting or something everybody sitting in those black hats and they, you know whiskers and all sorts of things 
and that's where the funeral took place. So they were difficult moments, they were difficult things, but uh, I have written much about any of this. I have a question. Can yes. we leave on a happy note? Can you tell us something hilarious that happened with you? About what? In your diplomatic <laughs> career. <laughs> well, hundreds of things, but uh, in the spur of the moment. Well, I can tell you a couple of things from my protocol days. I was deputy chief of protocol in the early 90s, 1992-93, and which is essentially the ceremonial bandobast guy, you know, for visits of presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers to India and going out, but mostly incoming those days. And you have to handle everything and, you know, programs, gari, meeting, kursi, table, glass, chai, you know, table plans, all that sort of thing. And I had the Sultan of Brunei was visiting India. And so two things of significance happened. He came uh, with his second wife. He had more than one. Uh, he came with his second wife and we went to uh, the Taj, uh, the Taj Mahal in Agra and uh, it was a very hot day, it was summer. So he, you know, you have to take off your shoes and wear those uh, gunny bag sort of things. So he went up and we were coming down and I was leading him in front, he was behind me. Uh, the Maharani was behind him, so I saw that the marble was slippery and hot, so uh, I told him, Your Majesty, please be careful, it's slippery. Uh, he turned around to tell her that, you know, be careful, it's slippery. In the process, he slipped himself. <laughs> so I had the richest man in the world lying at my feet. <laughs> but you know, the story doesn't end there. Then we went to sign the visitor's book, you know. And the lady, uh, her, her entire dress was sequined with uh, diamonds or something. It's this, this, this. You know, you looked at her, you got this uh, kind of chill mill effect. And then she was going to sign and she didn't have a pen. So one of those guides or sub guides or, you know, chaps who hang around, yeah. you know, pulled out that yellow and uh, blue <laughs> pick. <laughs> you know, 25, 75 pesa it used to be. And I found this lovely hand full of jewels all down, <laughs> fingers and palm, <laughs> signing with <laughs> Then she came to Delhi and she went to this Natraj handicraft and bought some huge thing. I forget what it was. And next day it was in the newspaper that she spent this thing, this thing for so many thousands, hundreds, thousands of dollars, you know, huge sum at Nadraj Handicraft. So I still remember we were reading the newspaper in the morning and my wife said, see, he gives her so much money. <laughs> <laughs> so then I did a back of the envelope calculation of his income and what she spent. And then I took out 25 paisa <laughs> and gave it to her and I said, this is more than he gives me. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Anna for giving us an enriching experience of your right, life right, right, as right. a diplomat and Jagyan Malaba, Udham Udham Singh Ji and the last part is really, really, we all enjoyed hearing that. On behalf of the foundation, I would like to formally express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Sarna and Isha for beautifully ushering the talk in your unique way. I would like to thank our distinguished associate Taj Bengal and media partner Mike Kolkata. Last but not the least, the audience, some old and some new. 
Thank you everyone for coming today. Your presence and encouragement has always inspired us to do more such activities. The foundation promotes, as you know, the foundation promotes cross-street cultural understanding and appreciation. A mosaic of cultures forms the bone of our nation, contributing to its vibrancy and richness. It, this is to support our ongoing efforts to foster unity and appreciation of the rich cultural heritage across India's diverse states through mementos, food, music, and art. With this context, we present we are pleased to present the author with one such giveaway, Dokra, on behalf of the team. Dokra, a non-ferrous metal is beautifully molded by artisans to craft artifacts, accessories, utensils and jewellery. Owing its name to the Dokra Damar tribe of West Bengal, this ancient bell metal craft practice is not only practiced in Bengal, but also extends to other states in the neighboring Orissa, Charkhan, Chhattisgarh and Kerala also. I would now like to request Mr. Mohan Chandran, Senior Vice President of Taj, to felicitate and felicitate Mr. Most enjoyable of great pleasure. Thank you. 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 है तो रह जागृत और सही है जो वो कर...